So now we'll go ahead and we'll dig into it. And you can see if you turn the page, go to the first page there of your notes, and we'll look at an introduction to the philosophy of religion. Now, a lot of you probably didn't sign up for the class because it's a philosophy of religion class. You probably signed up because it's an apologetics class. In fact, maybe some of you have never heard that term before, philosophy of religion. So you might ask, well, what is it? Is it the same as apologetics? Is it different? What's the distinction? Uh, well, there's, they're very similar, and there's a lot of crossover between the two. What they have in common is they both involve thinking rationally about faith. You could think of it as thinking about faith. We don't often think about those two as kind of bedmates. You normally think of thinking over here, and then faith is just sort of this blind believing over here. But philosophy of religion and apologetics both include thinking uh, and thinking rationally, at, mind you, about faith. But there are at least two distinctions we could probably make. First is that the philosophy of religion concerns the reasonableness of religion in general. So using reason and logic and philosophical methods, is it reasonable to believe in the existence of a deity or a higher power? Is it reasonable to say that miracles could happen? That sort of thing. While apologetics is a defense of the Christian religion in particular. So philosophy of religion is philosophically examining religion as a general category. So if you were to go to like a secular university and take a philosophy of religion class, you would learn about a lot of world religions and they would be examined philosophically. Apologetics, though, is very particular. Apologetics is not simply examining world religions from a thinking perspective. It is actually defending Christianity in particular from a rational perspective and some of the Christian particulars like the Trinity, Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. Apologetics seeks to defend those things. But there's another distinction we could make as well. Both of them utilize logic and reasoning, but one of the big differences, apologetics doesn't just use logic and reasoning. It also goes on and it uses science and it uses history and it uses eyewitness testimony. So this isn't strictly a philosophy class. It will involve logic, deduction, weighing ideas, things like that. But apologetics is more than that. It also includes uh, doing good history to say, is there evidence to believe that this event actually happened? Has this been documented? Has this been properly preserved? Is there scientific reason to think this or that is true? So apologetics is a little bit more comprehensive. So apologetics uses uh, reasoning and logic, but it goes beyond that as well. So we may summarize the distinction like this. Philosophy of religion uses reason and logic to examine the validity of religion in general. Apologetics uses reason, logic, science, history, and other fields of study to defend the validity of Christianity in particular. And next week, we'll talk about philosophy a little bit more. So now understanding that term philosophy of religion and its relation to apologetics, we're going to spend the rest of the night really focusing on apologetics. And this is going to be very much an introduction to it. So let's let's go now to section two, apologetics making a defense. We should start probably by defining what it is we're talking about. And I would define it like this. Apologetics is the reasonable intellectual defense of the truth claims made by the Christian faith. Apologetics provides evidence testifying to the truthfulness of the Christian message, and it provides reasons why the Christian message can be believed. Ligonier Ministries describes it like this. Apologetics is the task of presenting a well-reasoned intellectual defense of the truth claims of the Christian faith. When I was a kid, I went through this phase where I read everything I could about the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, uh, the Yeti, creatures like that. And I would, I would check out every book from the library on the topic. I would order books from other libraries so that I could read them. And you know why? Because I really, really wanted them to be real. I thought that would just be the coolest thing if there was actually a Bigfoot creature running around. If there was actually like a living plesiosaur, this dinosaur-like creature living in the depths of Loch Ness. And I read those books just pleading and hoping there would be some documented evidence that I could say with confidence, Nessie is real. Right? If, if I go wandering in the woods, there's a chance I might run into Bigfoot. And I wanted that so bad, but it never came. It was always real sketchy stories, and it was always really blurry photographs, and it was things that turned out to be frauds. And I remember feeling so disappointed because this thing I really wanted to be real, the evidence just didn't hold up. And so some years later, when I was a young Christian and it came to the issue of apologetics, I was afraid of that same thing happening again. I was afraid, okay, I, I really want Christianity to be true. 
But what if I do the research and the evidence just isn't there? I don't want to experience that disappointment again. And you know what? One of the things that awakened me to this need for apologetics is I was having a discussion with somebody one time. Uh, at the time, I was probably maybe 16 years old. And at that point, I think the Holy Spirit had got a hold of me. I trusted in Jesus. I knew I was a sinner. I would repented. I believed in him with all my heart. I, I knew it was true in my heart, but I couldn't quite articulate with my mind why I believed it was true. And I had a conversation with somebody one time and they said, give me a proof that Jesus is real. And I said, well, I know he's real because I just talked with him this morning. And they said, that's cute, but that's not evidence. They were like, a Muslim would say the exact same thing. I know Allah is real because I talked with him this morning, right? So just saying that isn't enough. And so that got me thinking, yeah, you know what? If, if God is real, if God is the creator of all things and God is the center of all reality, then I should be able to see the fingerprints of God, you might say, in the world. If Jesus was really a historical person who lived in a real age of human history, who actually died and was seen upon his resurrection, there should be some evidence of that, right? And so when I was uh, probably late teens, early 20s, I went on this sort of apologetic mission to learn as much as I could about is there any validity to this thing? I believe this so dearly and hold it so close to my heart. Is there any reason to believe that it's true? And in the back of my mind, I was bracing myself for a Loch Ness Monster situation. I was bracing myself for, I'm going to be, I really want this to be true, but I just don't know if there's convincing evidence that there is. And guys, I can tell you, I was blown away because I've never been so wrong. I was overwhelmed almost to the point of tears of just how convincing the Christian faith actually was. And ever since then, apologetics has been very near and dear to, very near and dear to my heart. Now, as we'll see at the end of this lecture, apologetics is not a substitute for the gospel. Apologetics does not save anybody. Uh, apologetics cannot change a sinner's heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit alone. But well, as we'll see, what apologetics can do is it can provide great reassurance to the believer, and it can help maybe tear down uh, some of the thorns and briars that have grown around an unbeliever's heart, maybe objections they hold, and it can help tear those down to make way for the gospel. So... Let's dig into apologetics a little bit more. I have another definition there from Norman Geisler. He describes it as apologetics is the discipline that deals with a rational defense of the Christian faith, whether the challenge comes from inside or outside the church. Now, that's an important nuance to add there, because when we think of apologetics, we typically think of those outside of Christianity trying to tear it down. But Geisler, I think, rightfully includes a defense of biblical historic Christianity against maybe groups that come up within the ranks that claim their Christianity, but they're actually a cultish diversion from it. So I just had uh, this past week, I had a conversation with a lady who's a Jehovah's Witness, and we got into John 1. And does John 1, 1 say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or the Word was a God? And as a Jehovah's Witness, she believes it's a God, and that Jesus was not is not the second person in the Trinity. So we had to get into Greek textual manuscripts and we had to talk about the original greek and the manuscripts and how they've been preserved i was doing apologetics with this lady who claimed to be a christian so apologetics is not just for the unbeliever but it's even for those within the church who would espouse heretical views that we have to then protect christianity against the hallmark passage of apologetics is found in first peter chapter 3 verses 14 through 16 and this passage is so key because first peter uh this whole book, we're actually going to be studying First Peter later on this year at Darby on Sunday mornings. And it's a perfect book because it's written to a church in exile. It's written to a church that is in a culture that thinks and believes very different than Christianity. We're kind of reaching a point in our country where for a lot of years, Christianity was the mainstream. And now it's getting to the point where Christianity is more kind of a minority in popular thought. And so I think for many years, this First Peter passage maybe wasn't as applicable to a lot of Christians because Kind of everybody breathes sort of Christian air. But now we're getting to the point where the church is once again finding itself as exiles. And so this passage, I think, is more relevant than ever. Here's what it says. But even if you should suffer for righteousness's sake, righteousness's sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. I underlined three words there, make a defense, because it's three words in English, but in Greek, it's actually one word, apologia. 
Apology is where we get the word apology from. Now, when you hear apology, you think of, oh, I was wrong, forgive me. That's not what apology meant. Originally, an apology meant to make a defense of something. It was a courtroom term used in a court of law. So if someone was committed or accused of committing a crime, their lawyer might stand up and make an apologia, a defense for them, vindicating them to defend their innocence. The defense that this lawyer might offer could be through proof. It could be through evidence, could be through argumentation, whatever. Whatever arguments the, the lawyer uses to defend his client is his apologetics, his apologia. So Peter is saying here, when the Christian faith is being accused of being untrue, the role of the Christian apologist is to defend it. Just like a lawyer's client might be accused of committing a crime, Christianity has been accused of not being true. And so like a good lawyer, every Christian, and notice this is not given to just a special elite group of Christians. This is written to the entire church. The church is to stand up and defend it. And I think it's helpful to look at seven different things about apologetics. Verse 14 gives us the context for apologetics, the situation in which we find ourselves needing to do it. If you should suffer for righteousness sake. This means that our beliefs will be ridiculed by a watching world. There's a whole world out there that thinks Christianity is just old wives tale. God is just some oppressive patriarch who wants to kill everybody's fun. Uh, Christianity has been changed so many times. We can't possibly know the truth. There's a lot of accusations out there against our faith. That's the context in which the need for apologetics arises. If everybody thought Christianity was true and believable and acceptable, there would be no need for apologetics. But that's our context. Second is the resolve of apologetics. Look at verse 14. Have no fear of them. As we go out and do this task, we are to be bold and courageous in Christ. That's our holy resolve. Although we may be mocked, although we may run into argumentation and counter arguments, we need not be afraid. Uh, I say their apologetics is a public expression of holy courage. Thirdly, the chief motivation for apologetics is given in verse 15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Now, apologetics can certainly play an evangelistic role. We should, When we do apologetics, we should care for the soul of the person that we're talking to. But you know what's even more important than that is honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. The main reason why we do apologetics is because we love Christ and we long to defend his name. Fourthly, the occasion for apologetics. When do you do it? Verse 15 tells us, always be prepared. In other words, apologetics is not some hat that we put on during certain times of the year. You know, once a year, you break out your special Christmas tie or your Easter dress. You don't have your apologetics hat that you dust off every once in a while. No, always be prepared. It's a constant endeavor that every Christian is called to be ready for. You think of yourself as an on-call apologist, right? So if you ever have a job where you have been on, on call, you know what that's like. I better have my phone turned up all the way. Because maybe if you work in like the nursing field or, so, you know, your job and they need to come cover a shift, you better have your phone turned up. Because if you don't answer the call and you don't go in to cover the shift, there's going to be problems. And in the same way, Christians are called to be on call for apologetics all the time. So studying this is really important because we can't be on call and ready if we're not equipped to be able to do apologetics. Sixthly, the demeanor of apologetics. That is, what is our attitude as we go about it? Do it with gentleness and respect. Apologetics is not a big club you use to whack people upside the head. It's meant to be an expression of Christian love. If you can, let's say at the end of this class, you can nail every single apologetic argument and you can just pull a rug out from every single skeptic you ever meet, but you don't do it with gentleness and respect, you failed the apologetic task because that's the demeanor and the character in which we do it. Seventh, and finally, the outcome of apologetics. Now, you might assume the outcome of apologetics is that people become Christians. Well, that'd be nice, but ultimately that's something God is sovereign over. You can't change somebody's heart. All you can do is be faithful. So what is the desired outcome of our apologetics? Verse 16, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Apologetics is meant to vindicate the Christian faith before a watching skeptical world. When we faithfully follow the first six parts of this passage, I think God will be at work to silence the prosecuting attorneys of the Christian faith. That when we do apologetics well, and when we do it with this good demeanor, 
People who make all these accusations against Christianity will see the testimony of your life and they will hear the witness of your defense and they will stop and say, wow, maybe there's more to this than what I thought. All right, now another important element is that apologetics includes both defense and offense. Now, the Greek word apologetics, apologia, means to make a defense. So we might assume that that means it plays a defensive function only. All I have to do is ward off accusations against Christianity. I don't have to actually prove that it's true. I just have to ward off skepticism. So an example would be, let's, let's go back to that court imagery. If you are a defense lawyer, in a court of law, it's innocent until proven guilty. So the lawyer doesn't have to prove that his client is innocent. All he has to do is prove that he's not guilty. Right? Now, apologetics, that's where, the, that's where the comparison ends. Because although we do make a defense, we don't make a defense only. We are also then called to go on the offense. And I think we see this in several other passages. Uh, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul spoke of his own defense and confirmation of the gospel. Notice both of those things. Defending the gospel was absolutely critical, but he didn't stop there. He didn't just defend it. He also confirmed it through positive arguments in favor of its truth. Now, I want you to imagine the Super Bowl coming up this upcoming Sunday. Imagine one of these teams has an all-star defense. They can block any offense in the league. They can stop any running play, any passing play, any field goal attempt. You've got the best rock solid defense ever. Great. Well, what happens if their offense can't score any points? You're not getting anywhere. You're just going to have goose eggs across the board. So we need to defend the gospel, but we also need to be able to make a positive case for the gospel and for Christianity as well. Because if we only defend it against negative charges, here's what we've done. We've made Christianity a potential option among many others. If we defend the accusations against Christianity, and we should, but all that does is put it on the playing field of raw potential. We want to go further than just potential, and we want to show the actual uh, uh, viability and believability and probability of Christianity. So we want to make positive arguments uh, uh, in its favor. Okay, now we'll move on to section three. Why bother doing apologetics? You know, if you're here, you, you're, if you're here, you hopefully think that it's important to do so. Hmm. But maybe you're still not sure. Maybe it's a topic that interests you, but you're wondering, why should I bother doing it in my life? Well, first, let me start by giving us some reasons to not do apologetics. Here, here's some, if these are on your radar, I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider submitting these to God and, and getting them off of your spiritual palate, because these are not good reasons to do it. Number one, don't do apologetics to win an argument. The world is a battlefield with very two precious prizes on the line. One is the glory of God, and the other is salvation of sinners. Those are our two great goals as Christians, to glorify God and to see others saved. And don't these nicely accord with the two greatest commandments, to love God and, and to love others? Although winning an argument might come with the territory of apologetics. Maybe you talk, somebody, uh, you talk to somebody and you've got this great argument that proves Christianity. Well, you might do so, uh, but that's not the end goal in and of itself. Simply beating the other person in an argument is not the end goal. The end goal is that they see the beauty of Christ and are brought to faith in him. So it's very possible, and it happens, that you can win the argument and lose the person. So make sure your goal is not simply to win an argument. If our goal is winning the argument, you've substituted the road for the destination. Winning the argument is the road, but what's the destination? It's to bring that person to see the glory of Jesus, to trust Jesus, and to follow Jesus. The second reason to not do apologetics is to trigger your opponents. Now, in our heated age, it's very easy to take delight in doing things simply because it gets a fun reaction out of the people that we disagree with. Uh, you see this happening in politics all the time. We justify all sorts of crazy things because it triggers someone that we disagree with. And we think, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If I disagree with this person and this thing gets them upset, then that's a good thing. Simply triggering someone is not a good enough motivation because that's simple and that's childish. That's basically what my kids do when they poke each other just to get a reaction. Okay, that should not be our reason either. Thirdly, it should not be to showcase our cleverness or our intelligence. Apologetics does involve the use of reason, logic, and argumentation. And I think a good apologist is able to go deep on these matters. It has been faithfully utilized by many brilliant men and women. You're going to read about some folks and hear about some folks who are way smarter than probably all of us in this room put together could ever be. No offense to any of you, but an offense to me. Uh, if you put all of us together, 
we still won't be as smart as some of these some of these men and women. Uh, Christ has blessed his church with them. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it not only so this not only fulfills the command there in First Peter, but I think they're fulfilling God's command to love him with all our mind. We should use it. Christians shouldn't be afraid of thinking. Again, we'll talk about this more, but we often make it seem like faith and thinking are like antithetical to each other. It's good to think. It's good to, to go deep. However, our own intelligence and ability to argue can very easily become a golden calf. And it can very easy, very easily become, this is all about showing off how smart I am. Now, if you have an argument that wows somebody, and they're blown away by how smart you are. That might make you feel really flattered. It might make you feel really good. It might give you this feeling of power when you kind of pwn somebody and you get the last word. You have this great zinger that shuts them up. You might feel really good about that. But when that when we do that, what we've done is we've substituted Christ's honor for our own. We've now made my intelligence and my pride the main motivation for this apologetic task rather than honoring Jesus. So those are three reasons to not do apologetics. What are some reasons why we should do apologetics? And there's at least four. First, to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. We already talked about this from 1 Peter 3. We do apologetics to honor Christ the Lord. Because here's the thing, guys. If Jesus is really who the Bible says he is, if he is really God the Son who died as our substitute, defeated death and hell, rose again and reigns over heaven and earth, then defending the truth of these claims is a matter of defending his cosmic honor. To allow Jesus to be called a lie, a myth, or even just one truth among many is an insult to the name above all names. And so John Calvin uh, put it this way, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. So a love for the honor of Jesus should motivate us in apologetics. Another reason, though, is to strengthen our own faith in Christ. Now, many of you in this room maybe came to faith in Christ without the use of evidence or reason. Maybe it was a really powerful prayer time, or maybe the gospel hit you uh, with just such a reality that you were overwhelmed by it. So many of us come to faith without the aid of reason or logic, but that doesn't mean that these are not helpful for confirming that faith. I shared with you guys from my own story, I already believed, but it was kind of like the guy who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You know, all of us, and we shouldn't be afraid to admit this, all of us will have doubts and questions sometimes. I was listening to a, a lecture by an apologist the other day. This guy's like a world-renowned apologist who preaches in universities and battles atheists, and he will admit, he's like, there's days where I have doubts, because to doubt is to be human. So God provides, I think, comfort and reassurance to his people through the use of apologetics. It can be a great assurance to us when we wrestle whether or not is what I believe actually true? In fact, there are several examples in the Bible where apologetics was done to reassure the faith of those who already believe. A great example is actually the introductory line in Luke's gospel. The gospel of Luke was written to a man named Theophilus. And Luke says this. He says, I'm writing to you, Theophilus, on the account of many witnesses, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Theophilus had been taught the Christian gospel. And Luke, and we'll talk about Luke more because he's a great apologetic. Luke conducted, he's a doctor, he's a physician. Luke is a very smart, educated man. He's a good researcher. And Luke goes on this quest where he goes around doing research into these events. He interviews a ton of eyewitnesses and he puts together his gospel on the basis of this collective eyewitness testimony, having, investi having investigated all the facts very thoroughly. Why? So that this Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things he's been taught. Theophilus is a believer, but this gospel reassures him what you believe. It doesn't just sound good. It's true. Theophilus believed, but the evidence fortified the faith he already had. So that's, it strengthens our own faith in Christ. But we can also study apologetics to strengthen other believers' faith in Christ. So maybe you feel pretty rock solid in your faith most days, but maybe you have a brother or sister who doesn't, and they're really wrestling with some things. You know, the Bible talks over and over and over again about supporting each other, comforting each other, encouraging each other. I think that the task of apologetics falls under those categories. Because when you see a brother or sister who's doubting the validity of Christianity, it's nothing less than doubting the reality of our Heavenly Father's existence, his righteousness, and his love. And so part of strengthening one another is doing apologetics with each other. We don't just need apologetics for the unbeliever. We need apologetics for the church 
as well. In fact, uh, I shared with you the example of Theophilus. An example of this is Jesus himself. You know, Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says that after Christ's resurrection, he spent 40 days with his disciples. The disciples who had seen him die and who were in the depths of despair because their Lord was gone. And Acts 1.3 says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. So Jesus didn't just go right back to heaven and then shout down from the sky, hey guys, I'm alive, you can believe me. He gave them proof. He let them interact with him, touch him, see him. He gave them proof to reassure the doubts. Can you imagine the doubt the disciples must have been having? They've wrapped up three years of their lives in this ministry of the Messiah, and now they just watched him get crucified in the most brutal way. You know how your hopes are all dashed on the rocks after that? Jesus knew how weak their faith must have been at that moment, and he presented himself with many proofs to reassure their faith of who he was. And then, of course, fourthly, to show unbelievers the believability of the Christian faith. Now, I know a lot of you just did uh, the last class with Danny, which was evangelism and discipleship. And evangelism is absolutely key. And I like that we did these classes back to back because they really go hand in hand. Uh, evangelism is critical. That's preaching the gospel, telling people about our sin, how Jesus died for sins, rose again, how we can be saved by repenting and believing. That's true. But apologetics is sort of the handmaiden to evangelism. So they go hand in hand. So I'm glad you did evangelism first. I think that's critical. But then apologetics is sort of a tool in your evangelistic tool belt by which you're able to answer those objections. Now, it's no substitute for preaching the gospel, but it can be of service in the preaching of the gospel. And the reason for this is because there's many people who have doubts and questions about Christianity. There may be intellectual and spiritual barriers that prevent them from embracing Christ. And 1 Peter 3 commanded us to have an answer ready for those doubts and questions. When a skeptic comes up to you and says, you believe you buy this whole Jesus thing. He, he's your source of hope. Why? On what basis do you believe this old fairy tale? And we're ready to explain to them to give this, to give this testimony. We affirm the truthfulness of the good news of Jesus. Okay, so those are some reasons to do apologetics. Now let's talk about apologetics in the Bible. Our age has sometimes been called the golden age of apologetics. And the reason for that is, guys, there are so many apologetic resources you can get your hands on. It could be ebooks, it could be audiobooks, it could be physical books like this. I mean, how many of you signed up for the class this week, paid like six bucks on Amazon, and two days later, this thing was at your doorstep? That's how easy it is to get our hands on apologetic resources. Now, there's some bad apologetics out there, but there's also a lot of really, really good ones. So we live in an age where apologetics is a really robust, well-defined field with a ton of great resources available uh, there. I actually want to make a recommendation to anybody who wants to study apologetics further. Uh, Biola University, they're a Christian university, and they actually offer a certificate of apologetics that you can do. Uh, you don't need to have finished any prior college work. You pay like two or $300 and you enroll in the class, you do the courses. Uh, and when you're done, you get this apologetic certificate. I'm about halfway through the course now and it's really, really neat. So if anybody wants to study it further, I recommend the certificate in apologetics through Biola University. And you don't have to write any papers either. So you'll be happy to know that. Um, but there's a, a plethora of wonderful resources at, at the fingertips of anyone who's interested. If you want to know more about the defense of the Christian faith, there are resources available at your fingertips. But just because we are in the golden age of apologetics doesn't mean we are the first or only age to care about, care about apologetics. And what I want to show you guys now is that the defense of our faith has always been an important issue for God's people, even going back to the days of the Old Testament. So we're going to look at apologetics in the Old Testament apologetics in the New Testament, and then we're going to consider an overview of how it's been used in church history as well. And what I'm hoping this does is maybe it gives us some good ideas of some arguments that we can use, but also provide this assurance that this, you know, the Christian faith has not been blind faith. You hear that sometimes. You know, Christians just believe in superstition. Well, that's never been the case. You study the Bible, you study church history, and there have always been courageous men and women who have offered reasonable, rational, proof filled arguments affirming the validity of what they believe. So I find this incredibly encouraging. So the skeptic who says you just believe in old fairy tales, you can tell them you don't know your history very well. 
So we'll consider some of those. Let's start in the Old Testament. Now, some of these arguments may be more or less relevant to you. So these are not necessarily arguments that all of us may have to use in our everyday life. This is just giving you an overview of arguments that God's people had to utilize at different points. Because we face different, as culture changes and as history changes, we encounter different objections. We encounter different barriers. And so the apologetic method utilized by God's people tends to be different depending on the age. So some of these may still be relevant. Some of them may not. But let's look first in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament period, the number one challenge faced by the Israelites was all the, polytheist, uh, the polytheism of the surrounding nations. Now, next week, we're going to talk a bit more about what's the difference between polytheism, monotheism, agnosticism, atheism, pantheism, panentheism. What's the difference between them all? You probably all know already, though, polytheism is the worship of many gods, right? Mono is one, so that's one god. Poly is many. So polytheism was the worship of more than one God. And Israel is exclusively monotheistic, and they're surrounded by all these countries that are polytheistic. Now, in Israel's context, there was very little debate about the existence of the supernatural. So today, we have this whole debate about, is God real? Is there really a spiritual world? That wouldn't have even been a matter of debate for the Israelites, because everybody believed in a deity or a higher power uh, in, in of some way. Nor did these other nations, and this is interesting, nor did these other nations question whether or not Israel's God was real. Many of these nations believed that Israel's God was real. They just didn't think he was the only God. That was the one of the things about being a polytheist, is you didn't have to argue that any gods were false. You just took them all. You said, okay, so here's the God of the Philistines, and there's the God of the Amalekites, and there's the gods of the Israelites. Everybody has their, it's very much like the pluralistic society of our day. It's what works for you works for you. I've got my faith. That's real for me. You know, you've got your religious beliefs. That's true for you. And some of the nations would incorporate the worship of other nations' gods. So the challenge Israel had to face was not whether or not the supernatural existed, nor was it whether their God was real. The challenge they had to face was our God is the only God. That was the apologetic task they had to face. And this was done, I think, through three primary ways in the Old Testament. Miracles, fulfilled prophecy, and the irrationality of idolatry. So first we see miracles. In order to demonstrate the reality of Israel's God over and against all these other gods of the surrounding nations, his supernatural activity is often contrasted with their lack of activity. So you can think about the showdown at Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Right, where the both groups set up these altars and they each call on their respective deities. The prophets of Baal dance and scream and cut themselves all day long, calling on Baal to come and consume the altar. And if fire would fall, that would prove that Baal is real. Well, nobody answered because there was no Baal. Well, then you've got Elijah who calls out to the Lord, and sure enough, flames come down in the presence of everybody. Everybody there sees the fire from heaven, consume the altar. And by the end of the story, everybody is just chanting, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Another example would be the showdown between Moses and Pharaoh and Pharaoh's magicians, right? Uh, Moses, uh, God brings through Moses these 10 plagues of Egypt. And when you study the nature of the plagues, it's interesting. They mostly line up with some, they attack some realm of authority that the Egyptian gods supposedly have. And the further into the plagues you get, the more Pharaoh's magicians can't, can't respond. They got nothing. And to the point they actually go to Pharaoh and say, we can't compete with this God anymore. He's proven his dominance. So through these types of miracles, it shows the reality of Israel's God, and it shows the power of Israel's God. Another one that's used is fulfilled prophecy. The Old Testament prophets very often appealed to the fulfillment of God's word as evidence of his truthfulness. For example, Jeremiah prophesied that Judah would be hauled into captivity for 70 years and then God would bring them back and restore them in the land. And sure enough, that's what happened. The Babylonians carted them off. They were there for 70 years. And then God providentially raised up Cyrus of Persia, who allowed them to return. And when they returned, they looked back at that prophecy and said, oh my goodness, Jeremiah was right. Almost like God really spoke or something. Another thing we see in the Old Testament is the irrationality of idolatry. The Old Testament frequently points out that idol worship is stupid. Like, it's, a, it's not coherent, 
It's illogical. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. So Isaiah 44, 12 through 20 is one of the most detailed sort of scathing rebukes of this. Uh, and it goes through this process of, okay, here's what happens. Men craft idols by their own hands out of earth and material. Then they claim that this block of wood or stone has this divine nature, even though it can't see or hear. It says, do you, do you hear what you're saying? You take this chunk of created matter, you carve it out, you set it up on a pedestal, and then you ascribe divine sovereignty to it. And the author points out the absolute irrationality of such a view. How can man depend on something that depends on man for its existence? How can something created from the natural world have control over the natural world? How can something without the ability to hear or see or move respond to prayer or requests from help? And so the, the prophets point out the utter irrationality of idolatry. So these are three tactics that we see being used in the Old Testament. We're going to go ahead and take our break. And when we come back, we'll consider the New Testament. And this one's a little more in depth. And I think we'll actually see a lot more complex arguments that we could probably start relating with in some of the situations we face today. So let's take probably about maybe five, 10 minutes, go use the restroom, get a drink, and we'll resu uh, resume here shortly. Go ahead and take a seat. And, uh, you know, as you're getting seated, I was just reminded of, uh, I was talking with Robin just a minute ago, and uh, I was telling her how, you know, my kick with the Loch Ness Monster, uh, unfortunately, my oldest son, William, has kind of taken up the same thing. And I didn't even teach him that. It just, he likes monsters. And so when he heard rumor that, you know, there could be a real one, he caught the same fire. So he likewise has a stack of books all about the Loch Ness Monster. And uh, it, uh, I was trying to prep him like gently, like, you know, son, that's a fake picture. And this is probably not real. And he's just like, but, but it could be real, right, daddy? And I was like, no, oh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus is real. That's the important thing. Uh, <laughs> So let's go ahead and uh, look on page eight on our notes, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the apologetics used in the New Testament. Now, as we get to the New Testament era, Jesus has come, uh, Jesus dies, rises again, the church is established. Early Christians faced a double-sided apologetic task because they still had the pagan polytheistic culture to deal with, like the Israelites did, but now they also have oppression from the monotheistic Jews, kind of from from whence they came so you've got the jews on one side who believe the old testament but reject jesus as messiah and then you've got the pagan gentiles on the other so now you've got a double feature that you have to pull off uh but what's important to note is that the starting point with each group was different when you study how the early church did apologetics with the jews and with the gentiles it was different. They didn't approach it the same way because both groups had different presuppositions and different starting points. So, for example, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter gives his sermon at Pentecost, he quotes no less than three Old Testament passages explaining to the Jews that the Messiah has come in fulfillment of Scripture, and it's Jesus. Peter did not have to give an argument that there is one God. He did not have to give an argument that God had spoken in the scriptures, and he didn't have to give an argument that God had promised a Messiah in those scriptures. Why? Because the Jews already believed that. So Peter's apologetic task was to, on the basis of what he already held in common with the Jews, demonstrate to them Jesus is that Messiah. We see Paul taking a very different approach in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes into Athens. And if you know your world history, you know Athens was the heart of Greek philosophy. Athens was like the philosophical crown jewel of ancient Greece. That's where you had guys like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all of them. They all came from Athens. When Paul goes and debates with the Greek philosophers in Athens, he adopts a different starting point. Paul couldn't start by just saying Jesus is the Messiah because the Greeks didn't share his worldview. The Greeks did not believe in a single monotheistic God. The Greeks did not believe in the revealed scriptures. They did not believe in the promise of a Messiah. So Paul couldn't just start there. What he did was he started with their worldview, showed how their worldview was inadequate, and then kind of transitioned them over to his worldview. And then within the context of his worldview, he introduced them to Christ. So we'll walk through this real quick in Acts chapter 17. 
He starts by pointing out, hey, you guys are very religious. You've got altars to all these different deities. And I noticed you've got this one altar that's made out to in the unknown God. You know, in case in your large pantheon, there's any deities who happen to escape your notice. This just kind of covers all your bases. And so he then reveals that this unknown God that you don't know about is utterly different than your pagan conceptions of deity. And I kind of outlined for you how he walks through that. He says, this God is actually the only God who made everything. Now, this contrasted with the plurality of Greek gods who were themselves created. Greek gods were created. He's saying, no, the one God is an uncreated being. He is, in fact, the creator of all things. He is utterly distinct from creation and therefore not in need of anything from creation. Uh, now, this was different than the Greek gods because since they were created, they were a part of creation and they needed certain things. They still ate, they still drank, they still slept, they still reproduced. Greek gods were just kind of like glorified humans. They were very much a part of the created order. And Paul says, God is not like that. He alone provides mankind with everything. Now that's important because in Greek mythology and in a lot of paganism, different gods provided you different things. You had the God of the harvest. You had the God of, of the sea. You had the God of fertility. And so you depended on all these different gods for all these various needs. And Paul says, everything you need comes from that one God. He is the God over all people groups. And this contrasted with the pluralistic view that, again, each people had their own local gods who ruled over them. And he said he's not just the God of the Israelites. He's the God of all people groups. And to make his point, Paul actually quotes from two Greek philosophical poets. So to make his point, Paul actually borrows from the Greek writers and uses their own poets against them. So what he does is he, he takes these points of commonality that he has with the Greeks and then uses it to demonstrate the truthfulness of his worldview rather than theirs. And once he had showed them the truthfulness of this theistic worldview, there is one God who is uncreated, created everything, who provides everything. This one God sent Jesus Christ as Savior and judge into the world. So at the very end of his speech, he introduces Jesus. Why? Because with, with the Jews, Peter just introduced him right away because that Peter and the Jews shared the same worldview presuppositions. Paul and the Greeks did not. So Paul started by introducing them to his theistic worldview and then in that context introduced them to Jesus. So this should tell us, as we think about today, that our starting point might be different with different groups. Your starting point with an atheist might be different than with a Muslim which might be different than with an Eastern mystic, which might be different than, you know, someone who is deconstructing their Christian faith. Your starting point with them might be different. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, within the New Testament context, there's actually several types of apologetic arguments used. And I actually lay out seven of them here. So the first one is miracles. That's familiar. We already saw that in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus did not, this is really important. Jesus did not perform his miracles in a corner. I get ads on Facebook all the time for these revivalistic miracle man preachers who come to town, you know, these really charismatic figures who, you know, he calls himself, you know, Bishop Gray or something. And you come to this big tent and there's going to be a healing service going on. And what's interesting about those healing services is you've got uh, a controlled access point with bouncers who control who comes in and who comes out. You've got controlled lighting and the right music playing. You've got a selection of who's going to come out uh, and who's going to come up and who's going to get healed. The healings are normally like, oh, my migraine went away, things like that. Th when you hear about modern healings, that's what they are. And that is very different than the types of miracles Jesus did. Jesus went into where people were sick, and he did this publicly and dramatically in full view of crowds. There were not secret healings. It wasn't come behind the curtain with Jesus. It wasn't the disciples are screening who comes in and who doesn't. Uh, you know, and Bartholomew's playing the right music in the background. And, and Peter's kicking somebody out because they actually have cancer and we can't have you in here. Uh, it's anybody and everybody. You've got people who have been blind from birth. People who are paraplegics. Uh, people with missing limbs. Uh, people who are dead. And in full public view, Jesus performs these miracles for everybody to see. In fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus even told his skeptics, don't believe in me if my miracles are illegitimate. Jesus actually invited them 
investigate the public miracles I'm doing that you can see for yourself. And if they're not legitimate, don't believe me. He says this in John, John, uh, in John 10. He says, the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand. The Father's in me, and I am in the Father. I think the New Testament authors, and Jesus in particular, understood anybody could make extravagant claims. You know, anybody could just stand up and announce, I'm the Son of God, or I'm somebody special. But extravagant claims require extravagant validation. And so Jesus publicly performs them through these public miracles. The second thing is that of fulfilled prophecy. We saw this in the Old Testament as well, but now it gets up a, a whole lot. The fulfilled prophecy of the New Testament is even more dramatic because Jesus, the Messiah, fulfills dozens, if not hundreds, of specific prophecies about what the Messiah would do. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the study of, of Jesus, but there was one, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Someone who works with numbers. He was like uh, someone who calculates things. He wasn't an economist, but somebody who's really good with numbers. And uh, what's up? Yes, thank you. He's a mathematician. You can tell I don't like math. Okay? I, can't, I can't even remember the name. He's a mathematician. And he estimated that the odds of, of one person just fulfilling eight of the Old Testament prophecies, you would have as much a chance if you filled the whole state of Texas uh, with, with silver dollars. I think it was something like a couple feet high. The whole state of Texas, a couple feet high, full of silver dollars. You threw your silver dollar in there, mixed up the whole thing, and then blindly reached in and pulled one out. You would have a better chance of that one being yours than one person fulfilling even eight of these specific Old Testament prophecies. And Jesus fulfilled way more than eight. So the apostles very frequently pointed to the fulfillment of these prophecies as evidence. Because if you think about it, it makes, you know, when we hear prophecy, it sounds a little superstitious to us. It sounds a little hokey. But if you think about it, if there is a God and there is a God who has spoken, we should fully expect that he would be able to tell us what's going to happen in the future because he controls the future. So if that were, if you could document this person actually fulfilled all of these prophecies, that's very good reason to think that God is at work. The third thing is eyewitness testimony. Oh my goodness, guys. Eyewitness testimony is a huge part of scripture. Everywhere you read in the New Testament, it is constant appeal to eyewitness testimony. So for example, we already read about how when Luke wrote his gospel, he said he wrote it after interviewing many eyewitnesses. Luke didn't sit down and get over his writer's block and just come up with a good story. He actually went around. Luke writes his gospel, I think probably within 30 to 40 years of Jesus's life when lots of people are still alive who are a part of it. Luke interviewed people like Mary, people who were there, and he got firsthand eyewitness testimony from them. Peter and John both said, hey, what we are telling you is not made up fairy tales. We were there, guys. We saw Jesus. We touched him. We heard him. We encountered him. They appealed to eyewitness testimony. Paul called upon the eyewitness testimony of 500 people who saw Jesus after his resurrection. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, there were over 500 people who saw Jesus alive after his public death. So he had a public death and he had a public resurrection and over 500 people saw him. And Paul adds this note, most of whom are still alive. Why does he say that? Because he's inviting the Corinthians. If you don't believe me, go ask them yourself. Most of these 500 people are still alive. And can you imagine in a court of law, if a case was up for dispute, and you could bring in almost 500 eyewitness testimonies, that case would be over real, real soon. So the biblical authors are always appealing to eyewitness testimony. But now here's what's interesting. The eyewitness testimony is not limited to believers themselves. There are several times in the New Testament where they appeal to the eyewitness testimony of Christianity's opponents. So, for example, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter's giving that Pentecost sermon, he says, Jesus Christ was a man accredited to you by God through signs and wonders, as you yourselves know. He doesn't say, guys, you know, there is this secret club where a few of us saw Jesus did miracles. He said, you, my listeners who don't believe me, you saw it happen with your own two eyes. I'm not appealing to some rando's eyewitness testimony. I'm appealing to yours. You saw it happen yourself. 
This happened several other times in, in the New Testament. In other words, they didn't ask their adversaries to believe the eyewitness testimony of believers only, but of other adversaries. That's a pretty compelling case. The fourth thing we see in the New Testament is through persuasive reasoning. Now, the New Testament authors did not retreat from the use of arguments. They didn't say, guys, just believe in your heart really, really hard that Jesus is real and it's true for you. In fact, the opposite. We see them over and over again using rational, logical argumentation to make their case. I included a bunch of passages there from the book of Acts. Notice how many times it says Paul reasoned with them, explaining and proving. He reasoned in the synagogues. He reasoned. He tried to persuade. He reasoned with the Jews. He reasoned and persuaded with them. Over and over again, Paul is employing the use of reason and argumentation to demonstrate the believability of the Christian faith. Another argument that's used is that of motive. What do I mean by motive? Well, very often you can tell whether someone is a, a suspicious eyewitness or not by what motive they have to gain from something, right? So if someone has money or power or opportunity kind of to their benefit, there's reason to doubt that they have a disingenuous motive when they give an eyewitness testimony. But Paul actually appeals to his own lack of really good motive for being a Christian as evidence of the gospel. What do I mean by that? Well, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul claimed that the reason why he trusted Christ was because Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. Jesus rose and appeared to Paul. That's what converted Paul. And as proof of this claim, Paul appealed to his own motive. Now, why is this an argument? Because if you remember... Paul was a devout Pharisee who despised Christianity. And yet in the middle of a violent rampage, he suddenly, dramatically, and without any apparent real precedent, suddenly converted and embraced the very faith he had been trying to destroy like two seconds ago. Why? What kind of motive could explain this swap in someone like Paul? And in Galatians 1, he rules out several motives. It didn't come from some desire within him. You know, it wasn't like me where I really, really want the Loch Ness Monster to be true. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to just say he is because I want it to be true. Paul didn't want Christianity to be true. He hated it. His job was to eradicate it. There wasn't some pie in the sky longing on Paul's part that I really wish it were true. He hated it. So that wasn't a motivating factor. Number two, it didn't come from gaining anything. Sometimes people go along with a religion because it's socially advantageous, right? Everybody around you holds to this belief, and you don't want to be the odd man out, so you kind of go along with what everybody else believes. Or maybe it offers you money and power. In the medieval period, there were many men who became clergy because the Roman Catholic Church was very powerful, and you had money and power on the line. So you embrace this religion because you have something to gain from it. But in Paul's case, none of that was true. He had absolutely nothing to gain. In fact, he had everything to lose. Paul was already rich. Paul was already powerful. Paul already had a great reputation. Paul already had authority from the Jewish leaders to do whatever he wanted with these Christians. Paul had everything, but he, he had everything already. All he had was stuff to lose. And he had nothing to gain either because what would end up happening if he becomes a Christian is now he's going to become poor. He's going to become a fugitive. He's going to become hated. So what possible motive would Paul have for switching over to Christianity? It also didn't come because of the way that he was raised. Sometimes we embrace a religion because it's comfortable for us. You know, grandma took us to church when we were kids. Or this is just, uh, I, I talked with a Hindu gentleman one time, and, uh, and I tried asking him about some of the reasons why he believed what he did about Hinduism. And he said, well, that's what I was raised. It's what I know. I find it beautiful. It's what I'm comfortable with. He couldn't really give a defense of it. It was just, it's what I know. Well, that wasn't the case for Paul either. He was raised a very devout Jew. His sudden embrace of Christianity actually went back on everything he had ever been raised to believe. So his point there in Galatians 1 is, with all other logical explanations exhausted, what possible motive could Paul have had for suddenly switching from being rich and powerful to being oppressed and hated, unless he really did see Jesus resurrected? Another argument is that of nature. In Acts 14, Paul told the Gentiles in Lystra, he said, look at the cycles of nature. Think about how you've been provided with food, how you experience joy and gladness. He says, these were all witnesses to them of the God who made all things and provided you with all things. Paul appealed to nature as evidence for God's existence. He made a similar argument in Romans chapter one. He argued that the invisible attributes of God, like his power and things like that, 
can be seen through the things that are made. He said, God is invisible. You can't see God, but you can see the effect of God's power and his attributes through the created order. And he said, this evidence is so strong. Just look at the fact that things exist and the intricacy of how they're made. And that leads you to believe someone did all this. And Paul thinks that this argument is so strong. He said that this actually leaves everybody without an excuse for rejecting God. And then the seventh thing is that of conscience. In that same letter to the Romans, Paul didn't end his argument for the existence of God with an appeal to nature. He then goes on in chapter two to say that morality and the function of the conscience also testify to God. So he said, Gentiles don't have the law of Moses, right? They don't have God's law on paper like you do. But you know what every person has? They have a conscience. Their conscience tells them that there's this thing called right and wrong. And their conscience convicts them when they do something wrong. But where does this sense of right and wrong come from? How can there even be a standard of right and wrong in the first place if there is no lawgiver behind those convictions? If morality really exists, then there must be an objective authority before whom we're all accountable. So these are some of the arguments that we see used in the New Testament. And again, some of these may be relevant for our current context. Some of them may not. The reason why we've gone over them is because I think there's three kind of applications we can get from them. One is that apologetics have always played an important role in the history of God's people. This is important because this will quiet the claim from skeptics that Christianity has only ever been about blind faith. And it will also quiet some Christians who say that apologetics is unspiritual. We don't need apologetics, right? That, that, that's too much brain work. Uh, we just have to be spiritual and, and, and pity and that sort of thing. Well, the history of God's people is one of offering defense for the faith. Christianity has never been a blind faith, and the Bible has never asked us to accept its claims on raw hopefulness or feelings alone. This should remove from our minds any sort of straw man notion that Christianity is built on blind faith or that the Bible demands blind allegiance without also providing very good reasons to do so. The second application from this is that apologetics has always been practiced in a variety of ways. There is no one standard method of apologetics that should only ever be used every time. Instead, God's people have utilized a variety of proofs. Thirdly, some of these arguments are actually still helpful in our apologetic con uh, con our apologetic context today. Some of these we may not utilize. The story, if you tell somebody, yeah, you know, Elijah called down fire from heaven and it, it, uh, it blew up the altar, someone's probably not going to find that terribly convincing. But so certain arguments still are. The orderliness of creation, the, uh, the reality of a moral conscience, the eyewitness testimony of these historical documents, that of historical motive. These are all still helpful arguments, and we're actually going to examine them more as we go throughout this course. So in summary of this point, the Bible doesn't say, believe me just because. We can immediately remove that accusation from the table. Rather, the authors in both the Old and New Testament provide an extensive variety of proofs. And so the task of apologetics is to examine those proofs to see if they're valid. If they are, then the evidence offered in Scripture stands. Now, we don't have a whole lot of time to do this, so I'll just do a real flyby of apologetics throughout church history. Because we talked about the Old and New Testament. Well, guys, it's been 2,000 years since the New Testament. A whole lot of time has gone by since then. So how has the church continued this apologetic mission throughout the years? The first period is that of the patristic era and the church fathers. This is, this is the period right after the apostles, from about the end of the first century till around the 6th or 7th century. And during this time, Christianity was spreading out into the Roman Empire. And as Christianity spreads, it meets all kinds of new challenges. So, for example, the Romans demanded the Christians participate in emperor worship. The Roman Empire often afflicted deadly persecution on the Christians. The Greek philosophers and the Gnostics challenged some of their key, their key theological concepts, like the idea of the incarnation, that God could become a man. Various Christian cults denied either the deity or humanity of Jesus. And then there was still Judaism in the background that challenged the way the New Testament was interpreting the old. And so the patristic era was marked by arguments defending Christianity from these, uh, uh, from these sort of um, attacks on their faith system. So you can see there, uh, I list there for you in the notes, what the patristic era was marked by. And there are a couple notable figures I encourage you to go and read about. Justin Martyr, he's one of the first Christian apologists. In fact, he wrote a book called First Apology, Second Apology. And again, 
apology does not mean, I'm sorry that I'm a Christian. It's offering a reasonable defense of Christianity against some of these Roman and Greek skeptics. Origen, uh, he wrote an apologetic book called Against Celsus. Celsus was a Greek philosopher who absolutely ridiculed Christianity and pointed out all these problems with it. And Origen wrote an apologetic defense of Christianity that kind of silenced Celsus. Augustine was another big one. Uh, Augustine is considered a titan of not just theology, but Western philosophy as well. There are many skeptical scholars who they don't agree with Christianity, but they will acknowledge Augustine was a titan. And much of Western thought was shaped by Augustine and by his defense of Christianity. Moving on to the medieval period. This was from around the year 500 to about the year 1500. Those are very rough estimates. This saw Christianity rise to dominance in Europe. The Roman Empire has collapsed. Christianity expands throughout pagan Europe. And as they did, the Christian evangelists and missionaries shot, sought to show the supremacy of Christ over and against these irrational pagan gods. And eventually, Christianity becomes the standard faith for most of Europe. So after Christianity becomes kind of the status quo in Europe, the biggest challenge for the apologists was the competing claims from Judaism and Islam. So at that point, you've got kind of the three major monotheistic world religions. You've got Christianity, you've got Judaism, and you've got this new religion called Islam springing up onto the scene. So throughout the medieval period, a lot of Christian apologists were, uh, were in debates with both Jews and Muslims to defend Christianity. There are two important figures I note there. One is called Anselm of Canterbury, and the other is Thomas Aquinas. Anselm of Canterbury was a, a monumental figure in defending the, the philosophical possibility of Christ's incarnation. In fact, he wrote a book called Why God Became a Man, and he answered this charge that how could the divine become human? That's philosophically absurd. And Anselm did a great job defending why it was necessary and possible for God to become man and die for the sins of humanity. Anselm was also an apologist, and he made arguments for the existence of God as well. But Thomas Aquinas, he was arguably one of the greatest thinkers in church history. My little son back there is Theodore Aquinas Narankovich, named after Thomas Aquinas. Uh, like Augustine, he's regarded even by secular scholars as foundational to the development of Western thought. Here's what Aquinas did. He used Aristotelian philosophy, that is the philosophy of Aristotle, and he used the scholasticism of the medieval period to demonstrate the rationality of the Christian faith. Thomas Aquinas was all about demonstrating the rationality and the logical consistency of Christianity. You read Aquinas for like two pages and your brain hurts because he gets so deep, but he is so eloquent as well. Now, unfortunately, Aquinas gets a bad rep in some Protestant circles, uh, because there was a lot of Roman Catholic stuff that he also agreed with. And also, he's been accused of subjecting scripture to philosophy. You know, he's been accused of saying uh, that reason is more important than faith. Um, I actually wrote a pretty extensive on a uh, pretty extensive paper on Aquinas in seminary. And I can tell you, reading his stuff firsthand, that's absolutely not true. Uh, Aquinas really, I think, carried on an expression that Anselm coined, and that is faith seeking understanding. I believe. And now I want to understand the rationality of what it is I do. I have faith in Jesus, and now I use the tools of reason and logic to make it coherent, to understand the intricacies and the rationality of what it is, I believe. And he wrote two monumental volumes called A Summary Against the Gentiles and A Summary of Theology. And in his Summary of Theology, Aquinas put forth what are known as the five ways. And these are five logical arguments for the existence of God. And when we talk about the existence of God in lecture number three, we're going to examine some of Aquinas' arguments. He, in fact, the first time I read them, I remember being so blown away. I was like, that is so simple and so profound. Like, how come, how come everybody doesn't believe in God? Like, we should arrive at this conclusion very naturally because this is so simple. That makes so much sense. And, uh, and Aquinas just does a brilliant job of showing just the absolute logical validation of the existence of God. 
Moving on to the Renaissance and the Reformation period. You don't find a lot of typical apologetic arguments during this time because by that point, Europe was pretty dominantly uh, Christian in its beliefs in the Trinity, the Bible is God's word, the, the incarnation, death and resurrection of Jesus, that sort of thing. Um, most of the controversies during this time were more in-house, you know, the Pope, how are you saved? This is the Protestant Reformation, that sort of thing. Moving on, though, to the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution. And this is where the stakes begin to get a little high. Because starting in the 16 and 1700s, you have what's known as the Age of Reason. And at this point, a firestorm of apologetic debate just erupted on the scene. And in fact, many of the arguments in this time are still raging to this day. Because the Renaissance was a time of reason and logic, and it was a good thing. But that optimism was taken to this drastic, drastic extreme in the Enlightenment to the point that there was now sort of this godlike view of human reason. When you come to the Enlightenment, there was the idea that we don't need divine revelation and we don't need God to make sense of the world. We can use raw human logic and reason alone to understand absolute truth. Remember, Anselm and Aquinas talked about faith seeking understanding. I believe, and the role of reason is to help me make sense of what I believe. Well, the Enlightenment thinkers kicked out faith altogether and said, all we need is raw human logic and rationality. We don't need God. We don't need revelation. We can understand all truth simply using the power of our own mind. And so all the traditional beliefs about God, morality, scripture, that all got subject to human reason. There were names during this time you might recognize, like Rene Descartes. David Hume, uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, what they did was they made, they made human understanding the epicenter of knowledge. Everything that we can know to be true comes from the human mind. And anything that cannot be arrived at by raw human faculties comes under suspicion. This kind of goes in tandem with the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. Because what that did is that actually raised the stakes for agnosticism and atheism. Because in the scientific revolution, it was a wonderful thing. And the scientific revolution, as we'll see, actually started because of Christian thinkers who said, huh, God made the world in an orderly way. We should be able to observe that world and, and may, uh, through these observations, come up with a scientific method, right? But then what happened was kind of like the Tower of Babel, you're, you start getting a little too big for your britches and they start thinking, wow, we're really smart. We don't need God. We have science. We can use the scientific method to explain and understand everything. And so God becomes an unnecessary category. No supernatural explanation is needed for the natural world because science can explain everything. And this was made even worse by Darwin's theory about evolution. And there were good Christian apologists during this time. I list a few of them there. Unfortunately, uh, this was actually, I, I think, how many Christians responded to the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. I think it put Christianity in a really bad place that I think we're still feeling the effects of today. So here's why. The Enlightenment claimed that absolute knowledge could be achieved through human reason alone, right? So not only did this ignore hundreds of years of Christian philosophy, uh, but it laid a choice before Christians, and it laid before them a false dichotomy. A false dichotomy is when you present someone with two choices as though those are the only two choices, and you leave out that there's also options three, four, and five. And so the false dichotomy laid out before Christians during the Enlightenment was you can have reason, logic, and critical thinking, or you can have faith. What's it going to be, Christians? And Christians, instead of saying false dichotomy, I'm keeping both, Christians said, well, in that case, I'll take faith. You can hang on to reason and logic, and all I need is faith. So what happened when, when that went down is Christians basically surrendered the floor to secularism. The other thing that happened is during the scientific industrial revolution, the same false dichotomy was laid out. It claimed that everything we need to know can be done through scientific discovery. The universe operates as sort of this machine through scientific laws. We don't need a creator involved. This also ignored hundreds of years of Christian science, but they also laid out this dichotomy. They said, Christians, you can have science or you can have the Bible. What's it going to be? And instead of, again, Christians saying, false dichotomy, I'm keeping both. They said, well, in that case, I'll keep the Bible. You can have big bad science. And I think the results of these two things were devastating because to this day, there is still this false assumption that faith and reason are enemies and that the Bible and science 
our enemies. And I think that's because as Christians, many people bought, they, they accepted those terms. And I think what we need to see today in apologetics is basically taking the field back on those things and demonstrating how the two go together. So what are some of the apologetic challenges we face today? We'll discuss these more next week, but you can read through the list there. Materialism, Darwinian assumptions, a resurgence of paganism and Eastern spirituality, postmodernism, pluralism, that the Bible's outdated and it's been changed. Christianity is a tool of oppression. Those are some of the apologetic tasks that you and I are going to face when we walk out our door. And so we're going to talk more about those worldviews next week. All right, we're getting to the end. Let's briefly look at some approaches to apologetics. This is your apologetic method. It's the strategy you use when employing apologetics. The first one we'll consider is classical apologetics. Classical apologetics uh, utilizes two steps. In the first step, you seek to demonstrate the existence of a theistic God in general. And then in the second step, you seek to prove the uh, validity of the Bible in particular. So first step, you demonstrate we live in a theistic universe. And you do this by offering arguments for the existence of God. With that established, the second step is within this theistic universe, God has been revealed in the Bible. Here's why the Bible's trustworthy. Here's how it's backed up by history. Here's how the, the manuscripts have been preserved. Here's how Jesus, we have evidence for his resurrection from the dead. So classical apologetics involves those two steps. So for example, in step one, you might begin by using these arguments for God's existence. The cosmological argument. This argues for the effects of the universe tracing back to God as the first cause. The teleological argument. That argues from the design of the universe back to God as designer. The moral argument which argues from the existence of morality back to a moral law giver. Uh, the classical apologist might also talk about uh, answering the possibility of miracles, reality of evil, that sort of thing. So the first step of the classical apologist is to establish that we live in a theistic universe, and these arguments are primarily made through philosophy and science. So that's step number one. Step number two, he then goes on to demonstrate that this theistic power is not some general deity, but the God of Christianity in particular, revealed in the Bible and ultimately in Christ. So this is where, again, you would give evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible, the accuracy of the Bible, the preservation of the Bible, and then also focus on the historicity of Jesus, evidence for the resurrection, that sort of thing. So the second step relies a lot on archaeology and history. The next approach is evidential apologetics. Now, evidential apologetics is very similar to classical apologetics, except it skips the first step. Instead of seeking to establish philosophical and scientific arguments for the existence of God, they jump right into the truthfulness of the Bible and the evidence for Jesus who really lived, really died, and really rose again. And the reason why they do this is because they say, if you can prove that step, the, the first step is already included in that. If you can demonstrate that the Bible is true and that Jesus really is the resurrected son of God, then that means, of course, that God already exists and created it. So the, the evidential apologist says, those classical guys, you know, they're smart, but they're wearing themselves out with an unnecessary step. Uh, just go right to the evidence for the Bible, and then God is proved in the meantime. Presuppositional apologetics uh, does something a little bit different. Rather than try to argue with opponents, the presuppositionalist actually says, hey, skeptic, you can't even use rationality or logic unless you first borrow from Christianity's worldview. The idea of logic and coherence and rationality, that doesn't make sense in your worldview. The only way you can even have an intelligent conversation is with my starting point. So the presuppositionalist points out the presuppositions of their skeptic are actually Christian. Well, what's a presupposition? A presupposition is an assumption you bring to the table. A presupposition is something you presuppose. So, for example, I, I, this one's a little more complicated, but the, presupposition, the presuppositionalist, for example, might be speaking to a skeptic and will say like, okay, you believe that there is logic, right? Well, why do you believe that? In your own worldview, Everything is random and chaotic and happens by chance. If the universe is just one big freak accident, we shouldn't expect there to be logic. There shouldn't be order in the universe. The only way that logic and order make sense is in my worldview. So 
you're actually, even though you claim to be an atheist, you are actually presupposing the tenets of my worldview in order to argue your case. They'll, they might do the same thing with morality. Oh, you know, you think that abusing women is wrong. Well, on what basis? Did you know that, uh, you know, male animals rape female animals all the time, right? On, on, in your worldview, how do you account for this idea of transcendent morality? Makes sense in my worldview, but not in yours. So you're borrowing my Christian presuppositions to make your arguments. Another one is called cumulative apologetics. Cumulative apologetics doesn't place its eggs in any one particular basket. It doesn't look for like that one nail in the coffin argument that definitively proves Christianity beyond a shadow of a doubt. Rather, it says the power of Christianity is found in all the evidence considered together. So, OK, maybe the cosmological argument isn't a slam dunk for the existence of God. Maybe the ev evidence for the resurrection doesn't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus rose. But when you take all the vast amounts of evidence and you put it together, you have a cumulative case that makes Christianity at least very likely. And a cumulative case is something that's done in a court of law all the time. Maybe you don't have a hard line of evidence that, that seals the case, but you accumulate a bunch of evidence that certainly seems to point in that direction. And on the base of the, the cumulative evidence, uh, someone is found guilty or not guilty. There's explanatory apologetics. Explanatory apologetics takes the experiences and observations about the world that we all share, and then it shows how Christianity offers the best explanation for these things. So, for example, why is it that within the same species, humans, we see such capacity for so much good and yet capacity for so much evil? Why is it that humans in whatever civilization you go to at any point in history, why do we seem so hardwired for religion? Why is it that every civilization has some concept of life beyond death? Why do we love? Why is there this thing called beauty that serves no evolutionary purpose whatsoever? If we're only material creatures, then why does material happiness not ultimately satisfy us? These are questions that are raised that explanatory apologists say only Christian, only the Christian view of the world makes sense of these questions. Okay, so it appeals to universal human experiences and then says only Christianity offers the best explaining power for why things are this way. And then the last one to consider is cultural apologetics. Cultural apologetics has become more popular recently because we live in a culture that's very skeptical of claims to objective truth. So in other words, you could present all the objective evidence you want to. You could use philosophy. You could point to the historical documents. You could use all of this. And the progressive subjectivist will still say, well, that's your personal truth. It's not my personal truth. So what do you do in a case like that? Uh, a person with postmodern assumptions won't find really any evidence sort of convincing because there can be multiple truths. So the cultural apologist seeks to provide an answer to that. So what the cultural apologist will do is it will take an issue that is important to the postmodern audience and will show how that issue only can find its true and full fulfillment in Christianity. So for example, our culture devotes a ton of attention to identity. It gives a lot of attention to community, to equality. These aren't sinful categories, but the way that our postmodern society deals with them are often wrong. So the cultural apologist will say, I don't agree with the way that postmodernists view these topics, but I'm going to take these topics that are really important to them, and I'm going to show how the gospel is actually a better solution to this, this need or to this concern of theirs. So, for example, when it comes to identity, the gospel provides a more secure identity in Christ that we don't have to define, and that is never taken away. The gospel shapes a new community of believers. Uh, equality is possible because humans have real objective value, and humans have real value because we're not just stages of bacteria. We are, in fact, created in the image of God. And so in these examples, the cultural apologist tries to show that the Christian worldview makes better sense of the culture's desires. Kind of make sense? Okay. So then the question is, well, which method is best? Well, hopefully, since we already studied the Bible and history, we already know there is no one-size-fits-all approach. All of these have been utilized very faithfully, and all of these have made great inroads into the culture. We have to remember, apologetics is not ultimately about the argument for argument's sake. 
but for the people we are interacting with. And so what I encourage you to do as much as possible is try to get to know the person you're doing apologetics with. Find out what their hot button issues are. Find out what their pressure points are. Find out what their objections are. And based on that, you will be better informed to use whatever apologetic approach fits with this particular person. So we'll talk about this more in our last lesson, our last lecture, but I would encourage you, learn to ask really good open-ended questions. One of the best things an apologist can do is learn to ask good open-ended questions. And when you do that, you accomplish two things. One, you make sure that the other person feels heard, that they know right away you're not just there to preach at them. You are willing to listen to what they have to say. And if they feel like they're being listened to, they will be more willing to listen to you. But secondly, it will reveal to you what their objections may be and what their presuppositions may be. And then you can use discernment to apply the right tactic to wherever that person is. And then the last thing to consider before we wrap up for the night is the role of apologetics. The role of apologetics is limited but critical. There's two extremes we want to avoid. On one hand, we want to avoid overestimating the role of apologetics but we also want to avoid underestimating it as well. What do we mean by overestimating the, the limits of apologetics? Well, it might be tempting to reduce faith and repentance to just intellectual exercises, meaning what a person really needs is evidence. If they just have enough evidence, they will become a Christian. But this ignores the fact that our needs are not simply cognitive, but spiritual. Our ultimate problem is not simply that we don't know enough information, but that we have a heart that's been calloused with sin and needs to be broken by the Holy Spirit. So apologetics is a wonderful tool that aids evangelism, but apologetics in and of itself cannot change a sinner's heart. That only comes through the preaching of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't overestimate the goal of apologetics and think, if I can just give a good enough argument, that's going to be sure to break this person's heart. The, the Holy Spirit might use that as part of the breaking process. But don't overestimate the value of apologetics in and of itself. And I give you some biblical examples of many times where there were different men in Scripture who had every, they saw all the evidence that you could ever ask for. If you were to say, you know, if only God would do such and such, this drastic epic sign, then I'd believe in him. There were men in the Bible who had that happen right in front of them, and they still didn't believe. Because the ultimate issue wasn't a head issue, it was a heart issue. But we also want to recognize the importance of apologetics as well. There are some Christians who would say apologetics is unspiritual. It's assumed that in some circles that apologetics undermines evangelism, scripture, the work of the Holy Spirit. And so it might be tempting to discount apologetics and say that it's not necessary. Why should we waste time on arguing when we should just be preaching the gospel? After all, isn't religion just all about faith anyway? What, why should we bother with evidence when we should just be calling people to believe? But that approach woefully overlooks what we've seen that the Bible itself, church history, and for many of us, we can even point to personal testimonies that apologetics has been used by God in powerful ways, and it's been a critical role in the life of the church. The apologetic task has been not only commanded in Scripture, but modeled and exemplified in many ways. It's been carried out by many faithful brothers and sisters over thousands of years, and it's been used to help advance the kingdom of Christ. The Christian faith, guys, is not blind faith. To understand that as we wrap up tonight. There are logical, rational, philosophical, scientific, prophetic, eyewitness, and historical arguments that all testify to its credibility. This is a wonderful source of assurance for us, and it provides a wonderful witness that we then get to share with others. The apologetic task is a command from our Lord, but like any of his commands, this is not something you and I can do on our own. It's not something we can do by our own strength. As we go through this course, we need to be praying for God's wisdom, for his discernment, for his boldness, for his love, for his humility and confidence in him. Now, the last thought I want to leave you with, the last thought I want to leave you with is this. One of the reasons why the assurance of apologetics is so beautiful is because if apologetics does its job well, and if apologetics can be used to demonstrate the truth of the Christian faith, and here's what it means. It means that the precious promises you read about in Scripture, the wonderful stories about who God is and what Jesus has done, it means it's true. It means it's real. It means that it's for you. Have you ever had a dream? And it was a wonderful dream. 
everything was right. It was everything you could ever desire. And there's that horrific moment when you're having this great dream, when you begin to realize that you're dreaming. Maybe your alarm clock starts beeping, a kid starts wailing, something happens. And in your dream, you hear this noise from the real world. And for a split second of horror, you realize I'm about to wake up and all of this goes away. None of this wonderfulness is real. And I'm about to wake, from, I'll wake up from it and I'll never be able to get back into it again. It's all gone. Christianity is not like that. Because if apologetics can demonstrate the, the truthfulness of Christianity, and I think that it can, here's the good news. There is no waking up from the dream because it's not a dream, it's real. All of the wonderful things about the fact that you were made with a purpose, that your life has meaning, that history is going somewhere, that God is the kind of God who loves us so much that he would take our sins upon himself and die for us to give us the hope of eternal life that defeats death. That is not a bedtime story. That is real. And it is a source of hope and it is a source of rejoicing. No reality can wake us up from this if apologetics does its job. Why? Because this is reality. The fact of the Bible is true. I praise God for apologetics, for how God uses that to provide this assurance to his people. My hope and prayer is that that does that for all of us throughout this course. All right, so you guys survived the first lecture. This was our introduction. Starting next week, we'll start examining critically some different ideas, start making some cases for the Christian worldview in contrast to others.